views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the hit show, Mouthing Off with Chef Rossi. Each show, Rossi, a.k.a. Chef Rossi, and author of the hit memoir, The Raging Skillet, mouths off about different subjects in a pursuit of breaking down walls and opening up our minds. Look out. She and Dr. Pat banter back and forth using the subject of each show as a framework for uplifting, inspiring, and what exuberant conversations. So get ready for that appetizer that will wet your whistle as we lean into the main course of the day. Issues, conversations, things that are heavy on your minds, but lightening up your heart. And ending each show off with that sweet, sweet, sweet dessert of inspiration. Now, here is your host, Chef Rossi. Hey everybody, I'm Dr. Pat, and as you heard in that introduction, it is Chef Rossi and I that are kicking it up right here today for all of you. Thank you for tuning us in and turning us on. It is so great to be launching this fabulous show with someone that has been passionate, live, lives her life on purpose, and Woo-hoo! is out in the world rocking it. Everybody. I am so dead. Woo! Chef Rossi, I, what a great! Are you excited about today? I mean, I know we've been Mama, building I up to so it. I am so excited. I can't even stand it. Like I've been trying to do other things, and I'm like, no, no, no! I have the radio <laughs> show. Who wants to do anything else? Who wants to work? Who wants to deal with problems? <laughs> Who wants to wash the dishes? We're gonna have such a good time. <laughs> All right, tell everybody about Mouthing Off Radio, because this is something that you've created here, and it has a very specific purpose. It has a very important meaning, but only well, so, Chef Rossi would know. Go ahead. Well, so here's the thing. I mean, yeah. reg- regardless of where you are politically and regardless of how you voted and regardless of how you feel about things in life, you have to admit that the world and especially this country is feeling pretty crappy lately. I mean, everyone hates everybody. Everyone's upset with everything. I mean, it's a whole lot of Michigas. Like, as my mother would say, it's like a Michigas stew. You know, I'm profoundly Jewish. What can I say? <laughs> so as a writer and an author and a chef and a caterer and a big mouth yenta, you know, I'm always looking for ways to try and change the world. And basically, you know, mouthing off. And so I think this will just be a great format for for the two of us to really talk about how we might change the world, try to open up minds and open up hearts and get people thinking in a different direction, in a different way, you know, and really let it all hang out. Well, I mean, you know, here we are, and it doesn't matter what walk of life you're coming in from. It doesn't matter if you're starting up a new business. It doesn't really matter if you're thinking, I'm not really sure what my purpose and passion is. You know, this show is really to re- to, to give us a, a way to explore some things, imagine some things that perhaps in our busyness we would not do. Exactly, exactly. Look, I mean, I know, you know, after the election, um, I, you know, I was very upset and most of the people I know and most of the people in New York, you know, and certainly, you know, all the Democrats and liberals, but, you know, really a lot of people were very upset. Um, and it was easy to just kind of spend a few days crying and being upset. But I started to think about like, what was, how was that going to change the world? How was that going to improve things? And so I started thinking instead of um, being so shocked and upset, why don't I try to imagine, imagine how it might have felt to be a coal miner in Kentucky. You know, if you're a coal miner in Kentucky, you have a whole different set of of things that are affecting your life. And so I tried to just take myself out of my Mm -hmm. body and imagine how it might feel to be them, you know, to be hungry, to be worried, to be jobless, to be wondering if your job even existed anymore, to be scared, you know. 
I guess maybe there are some people that can't even imagine that feeling, can't possibly put themselves in those shoes. But most people really do have at least one moment in their life when they were scared or lonely and hungry and poor. I mean, something, you know, even if you're a trust fund baby with millions of dollars, you know, maybe you can't imagine the poor part, but you should surely be able to imagine the scared and lonely (laughs) part, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're somebody like me and you find yourself at age 17 when most people should be celebrating life or doing something really kind of cool, you know, you find yourself now I'm begging for money at the Port Authority in New York because I don't have a place to live. I don't know anything else. But, you know, I've watched other people beg people for money, make up a good story about it. But yet I could never have imagined that. But you know, Chef Rossi, what you said is so important. I have had that experience, so now I can imagine it. But let's talk about us imagining, even if we have not had that experience, right? Oh, yeah. Look, it's it's an exercise in stretching your mind. Yeah. You know, like for me, it was easy to imagine. No, I mean, it wasn't easy to imagine mining for coal. I mean, God, that sounds terrible and claustrophobic. I'm like, I know. I'm like, Lord, I don't even like elevators, you know. But it wasn't hard to imagine being scared and being worried about money. I mean, I had yeah. many years of being a starving artist when I first came to New York where I really didn't know how I was going to pay the gas or the rent or anything. So I could imagine being, you know, really feeling that feeling. I mean, there's a certain taste that you have in your mouth. And if you've ever tasted this in your mouth, you will know what I mean. And if you haven't, just try to imagine it. And it's the taste of hunger and fear, kind of like an acid sort of a flavor in your mouth, which um, I had that taste in my mouth a lot when I was a starving artist. So I sort of went to a sensory place. I imagined tasting that and feeling that, and then I imagined those coal miners. So They don't care about the intellectual answer to who to vote for. They care about someone talking to them who seems to care about them, who seems to be promising them jobs, you know, and they're just going to go for what's going to feed their belly and what's going to get them a job. And, you know, and so that's what they did. You know, I personally don't think that they voted the way that they should have. I don't think they voted for a person that will do those things, but I can understand where they're coming from and why they felt that way. And so I think it's easier to try to imagine how they feel, and then you could try to talk to them. Like if I could talk to them now, I would say, look for the humanitarian. The next time you vote, find someone who has a history of being a humanitarian, who has a history of caring for the little guy. Don't listen to their words. Look at their actions. Someone just gave me that advice recently. They're like, stop listening and start looking. It's interesting, you know? Yeah. You, you know, and let's talk about this because, you know, I, I, we have uh, one of the uh, hosts of our show uh, are the folks at Orbit Law, and they are immigration lawyers. And, you know, I don't think anyone over there at that point in time realized that they would be thrown in the middle of what's happening now. But right. It, how would that feel, right? Even me, homeless at Port Authority, I was not restricted. Nobody chased me out and said, don't beg for money, Pat. But I can't even imagine what it's like for people now that are living scared. Uh, and, And I'm not just talking about one or two segments of our population. It's hard for us to imagine unless Right, Chef Rossi? We stop for a minute to do it. Isn't that the message? But you have to just stretch. You have, you know, we're, look, I'm, I'm a white woman, you know? So it's like, I know what it's like to be a woman and have the oppression of being a woman, but I don't know what it's like to have the oppression of being something other than white, you know? And it's like, we've had a whole lifetime of had, having all of this privilege handed to us and just taking it for granted. So It's like when I was watching the whole Black Lives Matter movement, I tried to imagine, you know, how it might feel to simply not be white. I mean, that's a huge transition. But it's like it comes with a boatload of prejudice and a boatload of horrible things. And to try to imagine how it might be to be Muslim in America right now, I can't even think of something more lonely and more terrifying. I mean, I know what it's like. I remember when I was a kid, we 
my parents, for some reason, bought some crappy little bungalow in Panama City, Florida. This is the 1970s. Yeah. So they dragged us to Panama City, Florida. And I guess nobody in Panama City, Florida in the 70s had seen a Jew or that they were aware of. I mean, yes, Jews go to Florida, but they don't go to Panama City. So the word got out that we were Jewish, and people started looking at us like we were Martians. And I went yeah. to get gas once, and the gas station attendant kept looking at my butt and looking at my head and looking at my butt and looking at my <laughs> head. And finally, I'm like, what are you looking at? And he's like, well, I hear tell your mama says you're Jewish. So I was looking for your horns and your tail. Oh, God. He didn't even think he was insulting me. He was right? just saying it like very matter of factly. I'm like, get the hell out of here. We don't have horns and a tail. What are you talking about? <laughs> so we were the others, the aliens, you know, and people just thought we were freaks and would whisper about us. And I mean, it was terrible. So it's like when I tried to imagine how it might feel to be Muslim in America today, I, I couldn't imagine how it might feel to worry about being deported. But I could imagine how it might feel to have people talking about you like you're an other or that you're different yeah. or shaming you or treating you differently. And it's a really horrible feeling. It really gives you a complex. I mean, it's easy to understand how a, a Muslim person in America today might be angry and might be afraid. And it also kind of makes me understand how horrible organizations like ISIS are able to recruit. Like by putting a ban on Muslims in America or by yeah. even joking or saying in press and public that they should register or anything like that, that's like a thousand Christmas presents to ISIS. Like now they have a great recruiting campaign. Are you scared? You know, come on over. Are you angry? Yeah. Come on over. Yeah. We have yeah. to stop doing that. Well, you know, part of this is, you know, let, let's point to some of the, you, you know, some of the books that have been published out there, you know, I, I mean, pivotal books that that people have read where, you know, we're talking about, listen, you have to listen, but you have to listen to understand understanding. How do you understand? Well, you just nailed it. You understand by putting yourselves in another place in shoes. What's that called? We'll talk about it when we come back. Chef Rossi is in the house. This is mouthing off with Chef Rossi. Today, for those of you out there, we're talking about imagine walking in someone else's shoes. Imagine that. Now imagine it's someone that you might have a little negative energy towards. Yes, even those folks. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Tune in to the hit show, Mouthing Off with Chef Rossi. Chef Rossi mouths off about different subjects in pursuit of breaking down walls and opening up your minds. She and Dr. Pat banter back and forth, taking from the headlines of the day on subjects that reach beyond what goes on in the world into your hearts. And go to theragingskillet.com to find out more and let Chef Rossi know what's on your mind. If you're dealing with fear and anxiety, you've probably noticed that the more you fight these emotions, the stronger they seem to get. Dr. Friedemann Schaub, the author of The Fear and Anxiety Solution, explains that instead of suppressing, we need to identify and resolve the deeper, subconscious root causes of fear and anxiety. His personal breakthrough program has helped thousands worldwide to overcome their emotional challenges. To learn more, visit thefearandanxietysolution.com and schedule your free consultation with Dr. Schaub now. How would you like increased health and vitality? How would you like to avoid the onset of disease as well as slow the aging process? This is all possible through a simple, safe, and natural process. Every day we are either moving toward wellness or away from wellness. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. I'd like to be your partner in achieving optimal health. Contact me now at MaryJaneMack.com or call 425-392-0659. Visit MaryJaneMack.com. 
Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Miss any shows during the week? Don't worry, we've got you covered. With the free Transformation Talk radio app, you'll have access to all of the past week's shows in the palm of your hand. Tune in to Transformation Talk radio anywhere you go with our free app for any of your devices. Check out our app in the App Store and Google Play Store today. TheAngelLady.net 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 1-800-323-1790 Sue Storm TheAngelLady.net And I, your willing victim I let you see the parts of me that weren't all that pretty And with every touch you fix them Yeah, hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, Chef Rossi in the house. For those of you, I just want you to know that you can find out more about Chef Rossi. You can go to theragingskillet.com. It's a fabulous book too. I want to make sure that you all know about. We're going to talk a little bit about it here in a second. Um, But the other thing is that, you know, this is a conversation, you know, this is passion and purpose from someone, you know, that has written a, a memoir that is written about a life story, but it's written about it from a very, very interesting and fun way. You know, this show is also about that. How do we bring in important issues, things that are on the minds and the hearts of of the people out there that are tuning in? And how do we take an exploration of these things in a very different way? Each show will start out with the raging skillet moment, as we've just done, talking about imagine. And then we'll have an appetizer, a supper, and a dessert segment. But it will be a little bit different than what you think. Chef Frosty, I love the format of this. I love what you're doing. For people listening, they're thinking, wow, appetizer, supper, dessert. Uh, No, it's not a show about cooking, but it's a show about cooking in another way, isn't it? It's a show about cooking in the way of opening your heart and making great yep. feasts. We're just kind of using the appetizer entree dessert as a way. The appetizer, we're sort of warming you up. And the entree, here's the major meat. And the dessert, here's the sweet aftermath. But because I am Chef Rossi and I do own the <laughs> Raging Skillet and I have written a memoir with recipes and I have been a caterer in New York for almost three decades, I probably will sprinkle in a recipe here or there because I'm pretty convinced that the best way to your heart may be through your stomach. Yeah. Look, let's get back to the coal miners for a minute. Mm -hmm. It is hard to imagine, and, and we were talking about this, it's hard to imagine that we are them. It's less hard for me to imagine having my stepmom being from the South and having a grandma that didn't have like a real stove until my dad bought it or a real bathroom, which he never did yet. So I understand what that's like and have lived that. But there are many folks, not only can we not imagine that, but it's hard to even imagine having a life that's filled with joy as well. Maybe maybe we should talk about that for a minute and what it might be like to have a little compassion for, for folks that walk in those shoes. Well, what, what is that famous expression? You get more bees with honey than vinegar, yeah. you know? Yeah, so yeah. Let's say, you know, that you're listening to this show and you're angry at those coal miners because they voted for someone that you're angry at. You know, we're attacking them and feeling different than them and, and looking down at them and thinking of them as less than you. All that's going to do is 
bring back the same to you, bring hatred back to you, and reinforce with them that they better stay on their side of the camp and better keep voting the way that they're voting, you know. Um, I think if you can feel passion and you can feel empathy, empathy is a hard one, you know. Empathy is really about imagining and, and caring and feeling them. Then you would know how to speak to them. and You would know what they need, you know. I would think that there are hopefully some very smart people out there who are studying this right now. How could they speak to them? How could they help them? How could they appeal to them? I mean, that's a very tough position, too, because a coal miner, you don't really know what to hope for for them because coal is a dead industry. I mean, we care about the planet and we care about the environment, or we should. Not everyone does. So it's not like you're, you know, hoping for a great big future for coal. You know, like if I was hoping for them, I would hope for a great big future for clean energy that they could all benefit from and get jobs in. You know, if I was in a position of power, I probably would be looking for ways to start clean and clean energy in Kentucky with yeah. lots of job openings for people that are willing to earn while they learn. You know, no experience necessary. Just come in and earn while you learn. That would be great. But I'm not in a position of power. I'm just putting it out there. Yeah. You know, there are things that we get to explore and look at by imagining. You know, John Lennon had that fabulous song, Imagine. And that song in itself opened up, you know, people's hearts. I mean, it became one of the pivotal songs of a generation. And yet, even if you were to play it today, people that may not even know, believe it or not, Chef Rossi, there may be people right now that don't even know who John Lennon is. That is a I reality. Believe it. I believe that. He thinks. <laughs> There's this whole generation of, what are they, the millennials? And the, who's after the millennials now? I oh, they're the them. one. Benny might know. They're the ones after the millennials. I know Jessica did a whole thing on the millennials. I, I mean, it's like all these people that have really short attention spans because they grew up with technology. We didn't grow up with technology. I mean, we had a rotary phone. I remember it was really exciting when they invented an answering machine. It was really <laughs> exciting when they invented a fax machine. But it used to be like you came home from school. Maybe you talked on the rotary phone with your friend, but you always had to worry about your mother picking up on the other line and listening in. At least I did. You know, We'd have to go, don't breathe for a second. And then we hear my mother. <laughs> we'd be like, oh, I'm on the phone. Hang up. You know, but you had to go out and talk to each other and read books and do all of these things, you know. So because of that, I'm capable of sitting down and reading, you know, and having a whole conversation. But, you know, young people today, it's like short, short, instant. It's got to be Twitter or Snapchat, and they're missing the whole universe flowing by. So yeah. maybe they don't know who John Lennon is because it took too long to read it. I know. But, you know, here's the song. When you hear it, the words of that song are extremely powerful. You know, they're powerful in the same way we're talking about this now. You know, we're living in a world right now where we get to imagine, we get to imagine our lives, right? You know, at some point, let me ask you this question about your own personal journey. You, you know, what was your imagine, uh, imagination like growing up? You know, what did you imagine for yourself? Did you even have room to breathe growing up in the city? I know I don't remember being able to imagine anything, but making sure I got the right bus growing up in the Bronx for sure. Well, How about you? Interesting. I grew up on the Jersey Shore. Uh -huh. I, don't have, I don't have big hair. I have medium-sized <laughs> hair. But I grew up with, in a Jewish family on the Jersey Shore. And I remember in the sixth and seventh grade, I think even in the eighth grade, my teacher would always do this thing, probably your school too, was they would ask everyone in the class, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the boys would say, I want to be a fireman. And the girls would say, I want to be a teacher or a nurse. And this is like the 70s, so not so progressive, except the women's lib movement was happening. Mm -hmm. And I would stick my hand up and say, I want to be president of the United States. Yeah. And everyone would start laughing. And the boys would say, you can't be president. You're a girl. And the girls would be like, I don't think you can do that. You know, you're a girl. And I would say, I can. Why not? I can do it. And my first couple of teachers were like, well, dear, you know, why don't you, you know, learn how to type and become a secretary instead? And I was like, no, I want to be president. 
Luckily, by the third grade, we got a teacher, Mrs. Ostroff. I would love to know what happened to her. Um, and she came in. She had a women's lib button on her bag, so I probably should have known, you know, that it was also a good start. And I said it, and Mrs. O I said, I want to be president of the United States, and everyone started making fun of me. And Mrs. Ostroff stood up for me. She said, no, she can do anything the boys can do. Girls can do almost anything boys can do. There's no reason why she can't be president of the United States. Just watch. And I never forgot her. Well, I never became president, and I never ran for a career in politics. But it always stayed with me. You know, thank God for Mrs. Ostroff. She didn't squash me like so many other people had squashed my female spirit. You can't do this. You can't do that. My own parents who loved me squashed my spirit. I mean, I remember when I told my mother I wanted to be a writer, she said I should learn how to type. Here we are, are again with the typing and right. become a Kelly girl, which <laughs> meant I would be a temp. See, people today don't know what a Kelly girl is, but it's basically a secretarial temp. Right. And I said, Mom, I want to be a writer, not a secretary. And my mother <laughs> said, what's the difference? Secretary's type, writer's type, it's the same thing. I'm like, it's different. It's a little bit different. I feel like it might be different. <laughs> Uh, I love this because I remember sitting around the it an Italian family because they would decide what each kid was going to do, right? You know, mm -hmm. the, the uncles came over and sat around the table and each kid was discussed and it was talk you, you talked about what each of the kids were going to do. You know, right. cousin Billy was going to grow up to be an accountant. Uh, my two uh, other sisters were going to go to secretarial school right. and there was me. I wanted to go to a music and art school and I, and my stepmom. How did they feel about that? Oh, no, that was never going to happen. I don't you know, think the, so. No, that was not going to happen. And my stepmom jumped in and said, yeah, I don't care what you all want or what you're doing. She's going to school for music and art. And literally the curse was put on my stepmother right there. You know, that oh, famous boy. curse that comes forth from grandmothers and grandmothers and oh, grandmothers boy. and grandmothers. Oh, yeah. But I didn't have to go to be a secretary. I got to study music. But here's That's the great. deal, right? When we the headline, her. I know it. I love my stepmom. Here's the question we'll talk about when we come back. I get an email from a listener this morning. They said, Patty, are you going to talk about this today on Chef Rossi's show? And I said, here's the email. Out of all the things in the world right now, and this is to what it means to literally, Chef Rossi, walk in another person's shoes. Are you ready? Are high heel dress codes for the workplace sexist? UK lawmakers are debating this after a woman wore flats and was sent home. Literally. Give those shoes to a couple of male executives, then let's talk about them. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back for a sup. Hi, this is Leslie Fontaine. Have you ever tried to just shift your present moment experience? Do it now. Just move your energy in a direction and watch what happens. Often we panic at the blocks that come up and we just stop. But today, try not to do that. Continue from your heart or solar plexus to shift in that new direction, whether it's in the middle of an argument, in the middle of some depression you're feeling, or some discouragement. What happens for you as you do that. The opportunities are amazing. Just hold that space. If you're ready to shift into your best life, visit me at lesliefontaine.com and let's talk about unfolding all that you want to be, do, and have. You'll find sessions, classes, audio products, all to help remove the blocks and move you into your potential. And listen to my show, Sheer Alchemy on Transformation Talk Radio, Wednesdays at 10 Pacific and 1 Eastern. Wow. Hey, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. This is Talk Radio to Thrive By. I'm telling you, I got to pinch myself some days because when each of us gets called to do something that we so not thought was in our wheelhouse to do, 
for a purpose that's so much greater than us, we get to show up and shine. If you would like to show up and shine on The Dr. Pat Show as a co-host or sponsor, send us an email to inspire at thedrpatshow.com. Gifted intuitive healer and spiritual teacher, Sarah Luce, brings her unique style to the hit show, Small Steps, Big Breakthrough Radio, on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Tune in each month as Sarah turns reality on end and shows us how to experience expansive results with simple yet powerful steps. Expect an enlightening bend on what you currently believe is possible. For show details and upcoming topics, visit SarahLoose.com. That's S-A-R-A-L-O-O-S.com. Sky Siegel co-hosts one of today's most popular psychic shows, Angels and Answers, with Artie Hoffman as she communicates healing messages from the spirit world. These messages can be astounding, enlightening, and life-changing. Born with the God-given talent of inner guidance and the amazing ability to heal, Sky has healed thousands of people. Schedule a reading with Sky now. Call 908-500-1474 and visit skyofangels.com. At a crossroads in your life, in need of answers, trying to discover your life dream or how to manifest it, Dr. Catherine Lehman with a team of angels, guides, master teachers has been helping people unveil the truth to the path of abundance and freedom for over 40 years. Training with shamans, teachers, and healers globally, Dr. Lehman will guide you to action in discovering your soul's path. Schedule a session today, 915-313-8541. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Chef Rossi is in the house, mouthing off radio. Yeah, imagine life, love, and glory. And here, if you want to find out more about Chef Rossi, you can certainly go to theragingskillet.com or you can go to Chef Rossi NYC on Facebook, Twitter, Chef Rossi. Go ahead, all of the above, and on the Dr. Pat Show.com or Transformation Talk Radio, you're going to find her banner announcing the show, all of the information. And for those of you, if you have not gotten a copy of her book, go ahead and do that. Um, you know, Chef Rossi, listen, before the break, I was talking about those those high heels, right? But there's a reason I was, because we're going to talk about supper now, the meat and potatoes. Well, listen. What do we do? What do we do here? How do we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes? You really, I mean, you really nailed it with that. I've been like, <laughs> oh my God, she's just like percolating, percolating. It's going to be such a good cup of coffee. So here's the thing, you know, this, I can't think of anything more sexist than making a woman work in high heel shoes. Ugh. You know, probably half of the things I chose to do with my life were simply because I would not wear high heel shoes. Like my, in my occupation, I go to work in a pair of, I, I have a pair of Timberland boots. I have a pair of orange sneakers, and I have a pair of black leather biker boots, and it's one of the three, you know. The orange sneakers were a little, just reason, like a concession to tired feet, you know, but I'm like, only if they're orange, you know. I can't imagine anything worse. But I would say this, like, look, all of you guys who somehow think that that should be what a woman has to wear to work, you do it. You go to work (laughs) in high-heeled shoes. You go and run and try to get a taxi cab and run down the steps to the subway and whatever, I guess they have subways in England too, you know, try to (laughs) run up and down the stairs, try to spend a day at work. I mean, you see women, the second they get out of work, they're pulling off their high heels and putting on their sneakers. They can't take one more second. They're like two steps out the door, you know, changing their shoes. I see them on the subway changing their shoes. I would say that to the guys. You try it. You know, I would love to see men try, really try to imagine how it is, how it feels to be a woman. I mean, just think about it. Like, guys, you're so stuck up. You're so comfortable in your own skin. Just try to imagine. How does it feel to be told to wear high-heeled shoes? Walk around in some high-heeled shoes for a couple of days. How does it feel to be sexually harassed? How does it feel to be pawed and grabbed? How does it feel to be looked down on? How does it feel to say a really intelligent thing based on really intelligent work you've done and have your boss pat you on the butt and say, that's nice, honey. How does that feel? Try to imagine that. 
doesn't feel very good. Your feet hurt. Your heart hurts. Not good, you know. I would even go a step further. I mean, we're talking about sexism in America, in England, around the world, you know. But I would go like a step further. Um, You're like, let's say you're a pro-lifer. You're running around with signs, you know, pro-life, anti-abortion. Maybe you've even gone a step further and hurt people who were at abortion clinics or done terrible things. You're a proud pro-lifer. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you to imagine, especially if you're a man, how it might feel to be 16 years old and pregnant with no money and no future. How might that feel? How might it feel to be 16 years old and pregnant and the reason you're pregnant is because you were raped? Try to imagine that, you know? It's not just about wearing high heels, but the high heels would be a nice start. So, for instance, I would very much like to see the president of the United States and the vice president of the United States and quite a few of their cabinet picks, their male cabinet picks, spend a few days in a pair of high heels, maybe red, maybe bright red high heel shoes would be nice, patent leather, <laughs> something like that. Just a few days. I'd like to see that. The only thing I'm a little worried about or not worried about, but the only thing I'm kind of thinking is that maybe a few of these guys might actually like it. And they might be doing it already. So I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. You know, I, I, I thought, Chef Rossi, honestly, I thought we were way beyond this. And you know what I'm really struck by is we're not. You know, I mean, clearly the article was talking about, you know, the London lawmakers really hearing this in a court of law. And I'm really thrilled that they are. And what I mean by that is I'm really thrilled that they stopped to say, wait a minute, are we now, even today, having sexist practices in the workplace that are affecting women? We're not even talking about the fact that you know the wage gap as as we, as we we were talking about earlier uh last year the wage gap exists now we're talking about these subtle ideas now let's say chef rossi let's say that maybe this company says no you don't have to and maybe there are 10% of the women that don't what might me, we think would happen to them I think that they'll wind up being victimized by sexism just the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they will. Won't wear, they won't wear the high heels and it'd be like, oh, just magically they didn't get that raise. Or just magically, magically. they weren't invited to that office party. Or just magically they got the office with no window. Or they had got sent more than anyone else to get coffee. Or, you know, these things are so real. Look, I mean, I sometimes I get into a little bit of a bubble. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I'm in a male-dominated profession. Certainly in oh. the 80s, you would not find women in professional kitchens, which right. I thought was so crazy. You know, you're, you love your mom's cooking. You love your wife's cooking. You know, why can't we be in the kitchen? But, wow, I mean, it really was not happening. But that started to change. The Food Network and television and things like that started to change, and now we're starting to see more and more women. And I started to feel like maybe the world's really changing. But then every once in a while, I hit a wall, and I'm like, wow, not so much. Even with the presidential election, you know, regardless of how you felt politically, a lot of times it came up that people would attack Hillary Clinton, and their attack would be that her husband had not been faithful to her. That was oh, the right. But right. I never heard one person question whether the wife of the other the, I'm just going to say the other because I just can't stand him right now. He makes me sick. But the other, you know, whether she was faithful or the wife of any male politician I've ever heard of was faithful. It never, ever, ever come up. No one would think to ask. I don't know if the first lady was faithful to the president, the one we have now, you know, never came up because no one would think to ask. But he's a man and she's a woman. But because Hillary Clinton was a woman. It came up. Was her husband faithful to her? No. Well, let's hold that against her. You know, other things that came up, they didn't like the way she dressed. They didn't like the way she smiled. They didn't like the way she laughed. I never heard once someone saying about a male politician, we don't like the way he smiles. We don't like the way he laughs. I mean, and people don't even recognize that this is sexism. You can disagree with her politically to your heart's content. 
but to sit there holding it against her, whether or not her husband was faithful, is insane if it's not going to be the same for the male politician. I mean, sexism, yeah. like, oh, my God, it makes me so angry. And people are doing it and not even realizing they're doing it. I mean, I sat in groups of very educated, smart people, and they said to me, well, I can't vote for her because look at what her husband did, you know. And I know, right. Crazy, right. just crazy. Well, I mean, there's a double standard across the board. I mean, you know, look, you have to be living under a rock right now if you haven't even gotten a little whisper of what's going on in the world. Now, I will say that many of us do not plug into the news 24-7. And I have to tell you, pretty much everything I post uh, that is of, of a political nature, I get from a listener or somebody that's on our email list or something saying, Pat, did you know? Pat, did you know? Pat, did you know? Ask people what they think. Ask them what they think. And, you know, what's fascinating about that is that people may not know about what's going on. You and I were talking about, I, I, I got a, a, a shout back from one of the networks I had been trying to contact and asked a simple question. I didn't understand why somebody in Congress w that's no longer in Congress would ever seal their records. I, d I just don't know enough about politics, right? To know I didn't that. think they were able to. Well, that's why I asked the question, because one of our listeners said, you know, this is what happened. You know, at the time, the vice presidential uh, candidate sealed his records. So I start asking back. Nobody sends any emails back to me. My own two senators send me an entire like book on what they're doing and how they're doing it. Do right. you find it's hard for us to imagine what it's like to be in another person's shoes because it's harder now to make those personal connections. Yet I'm not talking about a tweet or Facebook post. Is it harder for us to make real connections in this world today, Chef Rossi? Well, you know, it's kind of mixed because okay. we can communicate with more people now than we ever could mm -hmm. before. Uh, like when I was growing up and when I was in my 20s and when I was in my 30s, um, and even, you know, date showing how old I am, you know, my early 40s, you know, I would communicate with small amounts of people at a time, like my cluster of friends. But now through Facebook and through other forms of media, you can, com you can say a couple sentences that 1,000 people may read or 5,000 people may read. So first of all, I think you should be a little more careful about what those few sentences are, you know, not like, oh, I ate a meatball. Hello. You know, like that's my own personal thing. I try to like think a little bit about what I write because so many people are going to see it. So on the one hand, you can reach more people because of social media. But on the other hand, you're reaching out to less people. Like you're reaching more people, but you're really reaching out in a deep way to less people. So I don't think it's a good idea to let Facebook and Internet and email mm. and Twitter and all those things be a substitute for a phone call or for seeing someone in person. You know, I, I have a cluster of really good friends who I almost never get to see, but Yesterday, I spent the day with my best friend. We've, we've been best friends since I was 17 years old. She was my boss at my very first job in, in, you know, as an adult. Um, that was selling the New York Times over the phone. Lord, help mm -hmm. me with the story there. Anyway, we almost never see each other. She's super busy and I'm super busy. And we kind of just have, uh, you know, a, my, my website to her website email relationship. But we had brunch and we spent the day together and we walked around Brooklyn in the sun and talked. And I came home and I felt so good inside in this way, in this way that just nothing short of the human touch, of a hug, of a hello, you know, of just some real compassion and some real feeling like nothing can replace that. Now, we happen to like each other. We don't always agree. So... Having that with someone you don't necessarily like is a harder thing to do, but it's something we have to do. I'm not saying go out and love your enemy, you know. Just saying try and talk to them. 
I know on the book tour, I was able to go all over to places, places I, I never would have thought I was going to go. I went to St. Louis, which was a great experience. Um, I recently just came back from Texas, which has been a really surreal kind of great experience. Um, I've been blessed to have my very awesome girlfriend, Lydia, who I'll, who I'll get on the show one day, um, mm-hmm. go on the tour with me. But a lot of the places we went were very homophobic places, yeah. were very anti-Semitic places, places that were very sexist, not the kind of places that I would think would embrace me. And what I found in those places was that I was able to reach even the most homophobic right-wing conservative person with humor. Like the two things I've been able to reach them with, food and humor. So you can cross the world to another person's heart through their stomach or through their funny bone, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's go ahead and skip break because I want to make sure that we're talking about dessert. But, you know, this is part of the journey is to really be able to reach people's hearts. Sometimes it's with, you know, heartfelt, deep, intense conversations. Other times it is with humor. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think the point that, this, you know, you're making today on the show and all the shows we're going to do together is that that's the place we really should should aim to to go. And that is heart to heart, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Look, I, I had a great experience recently. My niece, Ruby, who, who uh, relocated from Los Angeles to Texas to go teach, um, invited me to come speak at her high school. And she wanted me to speak to her creative writing class, which, of course, I was excited about. But she also wanted me to speak at her other class, her general, I guess you would call it, like her homeroom, uh, about women's rights. And so I asked if my girlfriend could speak, too, because my girlfriend is a retired NYPD police sergeant. Mm-hmm. So I knew she could speak from that. And I said, let us speak as two women in male-dominated professions. Mm-hmm. Um, my girlfriend knew what it was like to be a cop in the 80s and 90s as a woman, very hard. And I knew what it was like to be a professional chef in the 80s. And so we're talking to these high schoolers in Texas. And, um, you know, it went, it went, it was kind of going okay for a while. Mm-hmm. And then um, one of the boys who was, uh, I'm, I'm guessing he was a little bit of a bully, um, mm-hmm. not, you know, from what I sense. He said, well, how can we really do anything about sexism? You know, we're just stuck with it. And I said, well, what if you start the change? What if you imagine what it might be like to be a girl? And I pointed to the girls in the class. What if you try to imagine how it might feel to be them, what they go through? Try to put yourself in their shoes. And he said, so you're asking me to handicap myself? And oh, I was wow. like, I was like, wow. I was, my wow. immediate reaction was I felt mad and I kind of felt wow. like punching him in the face. But then I just kind of breathed it out and I said, no, I'm asking you to just imagine, imagine, you know, lose yourself in what it might be like to be them. But afterwards, you know, the bell rang. I didn't have a chance to keep going into it. I thought, you know, he actually said something very smart. Yes. He said, you're asking me to handicap myself, to imagine being handicapped. Yes. So it was a good thing I didn't punch him in the face because it was actually <laughs> it was actually very smart and it opened up a lot of thinking on my part. Like that is the beginning of a whole other area of workshopping and talking. But yes, in fact, that's what I was asking this boy in Texas to do, to try to imagine being a girl. So here I am, this, you know, gay Jewish woman from New York asking this big boy in Texas to imagine being a girl. And he says, you're asking me to handicap myself. Well, (laughs) I guess I am. Anyway, it was very surreal. So I think that the step is just doing that imagining. You know, if I were a teacher, I would probably do that as an exercise, have everyone in class take turns imagining being each other. You know, if there are any teachers listening, I know it's not an an easy profession being a teacher, but Lord knows it's the most noble I can think of and the most important. Maybe have your students start imagining each other. You know, have your, if you have someone who's gay and who's out and who's being bullied, which is so common, I would ask someone who's straight, you know, to imagine being them. You know, imagine if just loving the person you love is something that people want to see you thrown in jail for or beaten up for. I mean, that is so hard to fathom. 
but yeah. let's try and imagine it. You know, it's funny because I went back to school uh, later in life for an undergraduate degree while I worked for the phone company. And one of the assignments was that we had to be homeless for a day. Wow. Um, and this was, a, yeah, this was social psychology. So, you know, the, the task was we had to pick a city, right? And we had to be supervised. Of course, we couldn't do it without having, you know, somebody with us. Right, you had to be protected a little you bit. You had to be protected. And um, I went about it. And I got to tell you, um, I, I didn't think twice about it. I, I knew how to ask to use the bathrooms. I knew how to find food. And the teacher said to me later, you know, I mean, everybody else, n- no one finished but me. Nobody finished the day but me. And the teacher said, never in the exercise were we able to actually have somebody finish the day according without cheating, without cheating. Mm-hmm. And, she, and, and the teacher says, I don't understand. How did you do it? I said, how did I do it? I said, well, I don't know. Maybe because I was homeless when I was 17 years old, I learned a few things. Right. And that's really what we're saying. If we are open to learning a few things. Isn't that really the pathway for us to get closer to each other? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I, I feel like, first of all, congratulations on that. I remember there was a newscaster in the late 70s or the early 80s who went undercover as a homeless woman <laughs> yep. for like three days. Yep. And I wish I could remember her name. I'm sure I could try and find it on Google. But she was so utterly transformed. I mean, she was yep. crying the whole time and heartbroken the whole time, but her, I'm sure to this day her life was never the same from just having those three days in the in their shoes. You know, like I pass homeless people all the time. It's very easy to see them as invisible. Yeah. But it's also very, very easy to become homeless. I mean, when the economy tanked in 2008, there were a lot of very successful, very educated people who were out of work and couldn't find another job and suddenly found themselves taking very, very low-rung jobs if they could even get them to do anything to get by, and it became a real fear. People, I think, have a tendency to forget painful things. You know, maybe you were having a few moments of your life of being scared or bored, but you almost want to forget it because it's painful. But it's important not to. You know, I think that you only deserve comfort and wealth and luxury in your life if you can have empathy for the people who don't. If you have no empathy for anyone else and you're just cold to anyone else and all you care about is yourself, unfortunately, you probably are rich because a lot of rich people are like that. But I personally don't feel like you deserve it. And I have to believe that one way or another, you're going to have to have some empathy, maybe not till after you die. I don't know. But I got to think it comes around, you know. Well, I mean, this is why we're talking about this sweet taste of dessert. We're talking about, you know, there is a takeaway from this if we allow ourselves to explore this. This is what this show, Mouthing Off, is going to be about. You know, we're going to be able to look at incidences like, oh, lawmakers in the UK literally going to court to talk about this. But the takeaway is there's a new level of awareness now, right, that says, wait a minute, that might be sexist, right? Well, sometimes, I mean, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned is that sometimes it's not about winning the fight. It's about having the conversation. Mm. You know, a lot of things that happened in the gay rights movement weren't about winning the fight. I mean, it took a really long time for anything close to winning. You know, there was a series on TV very recently, uh, I think it was just last week, called We Will Rise. Yes. It was on uh, four nights about the gay rights movement and really focusing on after Stonewall in the 70s going through to uh, marriage equality finally passing. And, I mean, it brought, I was really astounding to just think in such a short amount of time all this has happened. I mean, in my lifetime, when I first came out, you really could very easily be beaten for being out and gay. In the 70s, you could be arrested and thrown in jail. I mean, it's crazy. Oh, yeah. So yeah. it was a long time before there was anything close to any sort of a victory or a court yeah. victory or anything like that. But just having those conversations, just asking for the trials, just having people discuss it, brought it closer and closer and closer. The more people yeah. had discussions, the more people who asked, and finally, 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 you know, we got closer. 
you know, we have a long way to go right now, especially yeah. we have a long way to go. But just having the conversation in the light, you know, really brings it to the surface. Also, yeah. I I heard somewhere that someone someone said Will and Grace did more for gay rights than a yes. thousand gay rights marches. I forget yes, who said that's it, true. but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have a character that you start to love on television, then it becomes very hard to suddenly feel so cold to who they are. If you love someone who's black, you know, how can you then turn and want oppression for African Americans? If you love mm-hmm. someone who's gay, you know, even if they're on television, how can you turn and then want homophobic laws to happen, want Supreme Court judges to be nominated who believe gay sex should be criminal? You know, you yeah. can't do both. You can't have that much. I mean, um, I'm going to say this word cognitive dissonance, which you probably yes. know what it means. But yes. I studied it when I was in college, and it really kind of changed my life. And oh, the teacher man. said, you know, if you are doing something and you know it's bad, you have to give yourself a reason to feel better. So you're smoking and you know it's bad. You tell yourself, well, if I didn't smoke, I'd be, I'd be eating and I'd get fat. So I have to smoke so I don't get fat. Yeah. And you know what? I'll tell you what, we're probably going to talk about that on our next show. Chef Rossi, thank you so much. Many shows to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you do. What a fabulous show. Wow. If you all missed any part of this, it will play again later on tonight. You've been listening to Mouthing Off Radio with Chef Rossi. Tune in on Transformation Talk Radio. And if you have missed any part of this, check it out at theragingskillet.com or transformationtalkradio.com. Say hi to Chef Rossi. Let her know what's on your mind, and we will bring it to the next show. Visit theragingskillet.com, and don't forget to get your own copy of the hit memoir, The Raging Skillet by Chef Rossi. See you next time. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.